mentioned earlier where we called, um, we have um, one of the family members here is having a bit of a psychotic break. There were a couple of um, officers here earlier and they um, weren't able to find him. He is upstairs in detail now and he's throwing in some stuff right now. So if we can get a dispatch here, that would be helpful. Um, I don't know the names of the officers who were here before, um, but I can get those. So. Okay. I'm not, I am dating her twin brother. Uh, twin sister, excuse me. Okay, hold on one second. Let me double disconnect. I'm going to get a call started on this. Um, right. I have to just make sure I found the previous event from this call as well. Okay. Is anyone injured at all? Is he just, uh, like in the home? No one's injured. He's just in the home doing that. July 7th, officers from the McLean District Station responded to a home in the 6900 block of Arbor Lane in McLean. A family friend called with concerns for the safety of 26-year-old Jasper Aaron Lynch. 
A co-responder team comprised of an officer assigned to our crisis intervention team and a clinician from the Sharon Bulva Center for Community Health responded to the home. The co-responder team arrived around 7.26 p.m. and discovered Lynch was not home. The team continued to check the neighborhood for a period of time, but were unable to find Lynch. At 8.34 p.m., a second call for service was placed by a family friend after Lynch returned home. Three crisis intervention trained officers arrived at the home and spoke to a family member outside before making contact with Lynch. So, yeah. so we don't know his history. Could you, yeah. how old is he? 26. Okay. Yeah. Could you, ex, ex, I know, I'm not trying to demean him anything, not, but could you explain to us in your own words, based on you knowing his brother, um, why you think he is a danger he's, yeah. or he's unable to take care of himself or something like that? Yeah. You know his history and stuff like that. Yeah. He's, um, he's had, had um, issues in the past just with his trans male and came out several years ago and then I've seen it there ever since and he's been living with family members just to help him feel okay in terms of identity and um, he hadn't had any like dissociations or hallucinations before or anything leading us to believe he was attached from reality. Mm -hmm. um, his therapist had reported some like, oh, slight so concerning thoughts but nothing dangerous to himself or others. And then he was seeming to do better. My, my parents were with him. They thought he was doing great. They went out of town. And then he found someone very, very close to him, like a, a previous girlfriend that he really loved. He won, um, died, and now he is become like hallucinating. I was on the phone with him and I was on the train back and he was saying there are people out to get me. I'm scared. I'm, I'm terrified. Like, we need to call 911. There's, I don't know what to tell you with people are controlling my thoughts. Just like kind of schizophrenic type episodes. And I had a friend from over Shrink who was close by just to see if Shrink said that might be okay. And um, when she came by just to be with him, she started shouting at her and breaking things. So that since the first 911 call was, we've never experienced that either. We've never even been violent or an explosive like that. Okay. Um. What is he diagnosed with? Yes, we don't have an official diagnosis. We think so maybe it's not dissociative identity, but like he's never had like an official diagnosis. So one thing is um, you know, we're not like we'll help as much as we can, but we're kind of like more the last, not the last resort, but we're like if it's gotten to the point where he's gonna be yeah. going to harm himself immediately. Yeah. Um. So and one thing is if we. What we, what we can do is we can take him into custody and um, evaluate it. Yeah, yeah. Like, and then uh, we get him evaluated and it's up to the clinician if they want to keep it. Just be aware that it's like kind of a bridge we can't cross back because some people don't like the police or no, no, and we have that. and we have policies where you know if we take someone in custody, we have to search them, cuff yeah. them, put them in the cruiser. Yeah. Um, do you know if he'll talk to someone voluntarily? I think since he's really not since he touched your reality right now, like he might talk, but it might not make sense. Okay, I mean, and that's yeah. if he talks to them and they, the clinician determines that based on their experience that, yeah. hey, I don't think they can take care of themselves, then that's yeah. something else. Yeah. Then they can commit them and stuff. Yeah. Um, we just have to have like harm, self for others. Yeah. 
Did he cut injured himself? Maybe in the process, but he also when he was in there he said, um, Does he eat? Is he he hasn't eat? really been eating. I've been to my parents checked because he has to use his credit card to provide any food since they oh, left him over a week. Uh, he lost that boyfriend. Okay. Um, so he hasn't been eating, he hasn't been sleeping apparently. Okay. Um, and yeah, and he, when he was in there, trying to smash picture frames, he said, Call 911. Yes. Oh. I know it's like a last resort. No, no, but it's, we have to be able to, step, like, for us to, yeah. to take him to a clinic. Yeah, it has to be, it has to be pretty bad. Like, it has to be the point where we have to get involved. Like, yeah, I, I, and, I, I, and I understand, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have to pursue a route where you go to a magistrate and testify to the danger himself. Because based on what you're saying, it may be hard for us to get that from yeah. what he's saying. But we'll, we'll cross every day. We'll try and make contact. I'll talk okay. with them. And okay. him or her, was he? Yeah, it's him, yeah. Okay. He's well, I'll talk with him and um, I'll see if he even just wants to go voluntarily. Okay. Because I think if they think yeah. they have an issue and they want to help themselves, that's probably the best issue. Yeah, Rather than us force them. Okay. Where is he? So he went upstairs. So you see that back window up there. So that, oh, that's <laughs> can, we go, can we go through the front? Yeah, so okay. you can go through the front. And thanks for watching. Stay well and relax. Yeah, I'm going to crush another thing. Okay. Hello, Aaron. Put it down. Whoa. Put, put, it put, it down. Down. put it 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 down. We don't. Put it down. It's okay. Please. Can you put it down? Please? Aaron, you're all right. Where are you going to the chair? But it's okay. Am I a here? You're not in trouble. Yeah. Wait, you guys have to call for us. Remember? Hey. Oh. hey. The officers found Lynch inside the home, holding a bottle and a large decorative wooden tribal mask. The officers attempted to de-escalate the situation with verbal commands inside the foyer. Hey, bud, it down. Whoa, bud, put it, put it down. 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 We don't. Put it it's down. okay. Can you put it down, please? Aaron, you're all right. Please, one of the But it's okay. You're not in trouble. Lynch threw the mask at an officer and began to swing the bottle in a striking motion. Lynch ran towards the officers while swinging the bottle. Two officers deployed their electronic control weapons but were unsuccessful at stopping Lynch. One officer discharged his firearm, striking Lynch four times. Officers immediately rendered aid until fire and rescue personnel arrived. Lynch was pronounced deceased at the scene. Good afternoon. Uh, police officers uh, here and across our country uh, use force in response to resistance and in response to aggression. And every time we do, our profession takes it more seriously than, than ever before in, in our profession's history. On the occasions when police officers use deadly force, it's always a profoundly sad event. And, and this event is, is no different. A, a life uh, no longer exists. And 
because a police use of deadly force was involved, uh, we again take it very seriously um, and we conduct a thorough criminal and a thorough administrative investigation and we work in partnership with the Commonwealth's Attorney's Office. The um, release of this body-worn camera footage is, is consistent with our transparency and our body-worn camera release policy, which has been in effect uh, just less than a year now. But our commitment is each and every time uh, we have an officer-involved shooting and it's captured on body-worn camera that we will release it to our community within 30 days and uh, this, this instance is no different. We, so far in 2022, have responded to 6,700 calls for service for persons in mental or behavioral health crisis. And that 6,700 number breaks down to about 33 calls for service a day across Fairfax County. We use force less than 1% of the time. So I'll, I'll put that in perspective again, 6,700 responses to behavioral and mental health calls for service year to date, less than 1% of the time we're using force. Um, our county's commitment, and this goes beyond the police department, our county's commitment to adopt, and we have adopted a co-responder philosophy, uh, that's underway. We're in phase one, we move out of phase one and go into phase two, in just a few days, August the 8th to be exact. So as we move into the different phases of our co-responder program, more and more clinicians will be available to respond to these types of calls for service with our police officers. And I think you all know, and I think it was included in the, in the video that a clinician did respond out with our police officers on the very first call for service to this home. And then about an hour and a half later, that clinician had moved on to uh, another location at the conclusion of, of his tour of duty <laughs> to complete some administrative paperwork. That's the only reason why a clinician was not um, in a place where he was able to respond with us to the second call for service. Uh, and then I'll end before I take questions, kind of emphasizing uh, what is being spoken about a lot nationally, certainly regionally, locally, the 988 number. So, you know, we, we are committed, and I know that the chairman of our Board of Supervisors has recently spoken about the importance of the suicide and crisis lifeline. Dial 988, certainly dial 911, but 988 is also an alternative, an alternative rather, and that's something that we want to continue to draw attention to and, and promote as well. So I'll take any, any questions that you, you may have. So, Paul, they're underway. Uh, you know, one of the things about having a, a release policy, and ours is 30 days, and that's our policy. Uh, I think, you know, our, our partners in MPD have a five-day release policy, and I think that's statutory. But our commitment is 30 days, and we're at day 28 right now. So we are still in, in the process, the investigative process on the criminal investigation side. Our major crimes bureau is conducting that, and the administrative investigation is being conducted by our Internal Affairs Bureau. Uh, major crimes detectives are working uh, hand in glove like they always do with the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. Uh, as we receive investigative updates and information, we share those in real time uh, with the prosecutor. So this is a, a process. Uh, each and every OIS here or elsewhere is different. Uh, this one is gonna take a little bit longer to to assess and investigate. Um, the circumstances are different, and you all have undoubtedly seen a number of these body-worn cameras depictions um, for either critical incidents like an OIS or, or otherwise, and some are more clear than others. Uh, th this, this one isn't exactly as sterile because there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in, you know, that the camera captures, and there's a lot going on that our investigation will Will uh, will concentrate on that's not within the view of the cameras. So this one's going to take a little bit longer to to investigate, and uh, when we reach those investigative conclusions, uh, we'll we'll come back, um, Paul, and share that with the community as well. Yes, sir. 
<coughs> what's the department policy on clinicians responding to mental health calls? And also, how many clinicians do you have on staff during one time period? So, like I, like I said, uh, we're in phase one right now. So by the time we get to phase four of our co-responder program, um, we'll have about 16 clinicians riding with police officers. Uh, right now, we have one clinician that is available on certain days and times of the week that rides with a police officer. As we move into phase two of our co-responder program, uh, we'll add a second co-responder as well. And then we'll move into phase three and phase four. By the time we get to phase four, we'll have uh, 16 clinicians available, uh, probably eight working at any given time that will ride with police officers. And, and they'll be deployed throughout, uh, throughout the county because those 6,700 calls for service exist in, in all four corners of, of Fairfax County. But your officers are trained a absolutely. So I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So uh, the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia um, suggests, recommends that at least 20% of a police department's personnel be trained in crisis intervention. Uh, we are more than double that in Fairfax County. And in fact, all three of the police officers at this scene, and, and hopefully you saw that there were three police officers here, uh, two deployed their electronic control weapons or, the, or their tasers, that's the brand name, and, and one deployed his firearm. All three of those officers are fully trained in crisis intervention, and it is a one-week class. It's a specialty type of training that requires uh, enhanced training and retraining. So all three of these officers are CIT trained. Paul? So let me ch chop that up a little bit, Paul. So the, the de-escalation, and, and we, we require de-escalation as a matter of policy. Uh, we, we train our police officers to de-escalate. And in fact, and I think you're aware of this, we're, we're right now engaged in the gold standard use of force training that our country has to offer called ICAT training, Integrating Communications Assessments and Tactics. It's a police executive research forum a gold standard training that was developed back in 2015 based on a UK model of force. And it goes beyond de-escalation. It, it, it emphasizes and trains our officers to take advantage of time and distance. Uh, it's de-escalation training on steroids. So I think a, as you watch this video, and again, we're going to share it in its entirety with, with everyone, you see the, poli the police officers using uh, this young man's name. And, and they're telling him repeatedly to put the objects in his hand down. And the objects in his hand include a champagne bottle and what amounts to a, a wooden object. And you can see the wooden object thrown at our police officers. That wooden object uh, later turned out to be some type of decorative uh, mask that, that's usually hung on, on walls in, in homes. So, the police officers, uh, you know, their, their presence and then their repeated demands for uh, Mr. Lynch to, to drop what he had in his hands uh, amounts to verbal de-escalation. And then when the electronic control weapons or the tasers were used, uh, that less lethal force, I think, is another progressive effort to use less than deadly force to handle the situation. Um, and again, this is still under investigation, so I, I want to be very careful not to offer any assessments or any opinions, but I think it's clear to see from the video that that was a very active and chaotic um, incident. And I think it's fair to say that the, uh, Mr. Lynch, as he ran toward our police officers, and again, this is all being investigated, was, was an aggressive act. So it was a very difficult circumstance for police officers to deal with. That was a scenario, and you saw our, our police officers talking with his sister and talking with her boyfriend. We could not, absolutely could not have walked away from that incident. You know, we have a duty to care. 
And I think the police officers asked so many questions. And I know it took a little bit, and it probably several minutes, but we wanted to include that to demonstrate that our police officers are making every effort to ask the right questions because we just don't arrive on these scenes where someone's in crisis and absent any additional information go into someone's home. You know, those days are long gone. So um, certainly I, I think our officers, you know, were confronted with a very chaotic and dangerous situation. But again, the investigation that's still ongoing, and again, we're only 28 days into this, will eventually uh, speak to those other, those other issues, Paul. So that's going to be all part of the investigation. Uh, if, you, if you pick it up on the video, there's, there's two, two laser dots. One is red and one is green. The colors really don't mean anything. That, that gives the police officers who are handling the electronic control weapon uh, an idea of where their taser um, will, will hit. Uh, you, you saw that the, the person involved in this incident wasn't exactly standing still. I don't know how many feet away our officers were when they deployed their taser, but I think it's safe to say that they were several feet away and both taser prongs, if prongs is the, the right word, have to both hit in order for it to take effect. And again, our investigation will reveal uh, if in fact those tasers hit, if in fact they took effect, and if they didn't, why not? So I don't have that, that information at, at this moment. Does your initial investigation show that the officer Yeah, so so th there is uh, no preliminary investigative information that I'm aware of that suggests that that is the case. I certainly understand the question. That's certainly something that we investigate, but we, we have no preliminary investigate no preliminary investigative information that that's the case. Just to be clear, at what point did the officer shoot the man? Was it after throwing the second item, or as he was approaching? So the first item I think we can all agree upon, again, and I don't want to conduct an investigation uh, at this lectern, um, but I, I think it's fair to say that the first item that was thrown was the wooden object that I described. It later turned out to be some type of decorative um, uh, mask that hangs on the wall. And then I think the second item that was in both of his hands, first in one hand and then grasped uh, by its, by its uh, handle, um, was a was a champagne type bottle, and and we are uh, we we are in possession of both of those objects. So he initially had one in one hand and one in the other, threw the wooden object, and I think it, you can see it, I can see it, and then he transitioned to possessing the second object, which was that, which was that bottle that he turned upside down, and he held that bottle with two hands when he made uh, his way toward the officers. So the discharge of firearm was at that second point where he was advancing toward the officers, correct? And do you think if the clinician had shown up the second time that the situation would turn out differently? You know, you know I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I think what the police officers were doing, the second call for service that resulted in the deadly use of force, they, they were asking questions that, that, were, that, that would be typical of a clinician to explore as well. Uh, we want to get to the point where we have more clinicians and there's commitment from the chairman all the way through the entire board of supervisors and the county executive to make that happen. So we're in the process of making that happen. So uh, we're, we're, we're in phase one again of co-responder, about to move into phase two on August the 8th. And by the time we get to phase four, uh, we should have clinicians available throughout our 409 square miles. And uh, the goal then would be to hear these types of calls for service now, sometimes you'll get a mental or behavioral health crisis call for service, and it's not dispatched as a mental or behavioral health call for service. It could be dispatched as a trespassing. It could be dispatched as a domestic violence incident. It could be dispatched as a disorderly conduct. Uh, but those, those incidents, and our 911 call takers are really training up on this right now, and our dispatchers, when we can kind of intuitively figure out that there's a mental health or behavioral crisis happening, then uh, with, the, with the benefit of uh, additional clinicians on the road with our cops, be able to send those, those pairs to those particular scenes. It's not a silver bullet, uh, and I really, once we get into this, I just, you know, I think it's our responsibility, uh, both 
law enforcement and, and even local media to manage expectations, it will certainly result in many more better outcomes for people in crisis. Is it going to perpetually eliminate use of force? Uh, probably not. But again, when you look at use of force and mental health crisis, the 6,700 calls for service that we've responded to this year, we've only used any level of force less than 1% of the time. Do you have any message to the family and the victim on how thorough your investigation is going to be? Yeah, we, we've interacted with the family, and again, they're represented by an attorney, so um, we've interacted with the family on more than one occasion. The family has been afforded an opportunity, and they took advantage of it uh, to watch this video. Uh, we certainly don't want them to see it for the first time on the news, just like we don't want our police officers to see it for the first time uh, on the news. So um, uh, we, we take due care to, to do that with the families. So we have released the officer's name, and he's on an administrative status while the investigation is is ongoing. Which deputy administrative status? He's not assigned uh, to patrol or other public contact positions. That's consistent with the policies of most police departments across the country. Chief, if there was a clinician there, what would that? How would that look? Yeah, I don't want to go too deep down the uh, hypothetical hole. But I think what would happen in a situation like this, because we certainly want to, and we are developing right now what will eventually be a world-class training experience for all of our cl clinicians. Because we're not asking our clinicians to stand in harm's way. We don't want them to stand in harm's way. But we want them to be an additional asset to work in partnership with our police officers. And again, these three cops are all CIT trained. But our clinicians' training and experience would obviously be at a much higher level. So in the event that it's safe to communicate and safe to negotiate, um, that clinician would be there to help us do just that. Since this police-involved shooting, we've had a couple incidents that I think have been covered by the local media. One was a man who ultimately committed suicide on the Fairfax Parkway, and we had a clinician on the phone with him, um, speaking with him for several minutes before he made a decision to take his life. And we had another incident where a suicidal man armed with a knife uh, was um, on the GW Parkway and we stopped traffic in both directions. It was a big to-do. It was in the middle of the morning. And one of our CIT trained police officers negotiated with him for, se for several minutes. And, and he eventually came out and was safely taken into custody. And then just the other night, we had a barricaded man in a abs absolutely state of crisis on a fifth story uh, apartment. Um, and he was in crisis for several hours, and we negotiated with him. Um, we had psychiatrists and peer support and clinicians on the scene, and he eventually safely gave up. So the number of times that we, that we successfully negotiate with people in crisis is, is astronomically high, um, and we're committed to even being better than that. Just the other night, and actually the, the barricade that I mentioned, that was still going on at the same time. Literally uh, a stone's throw from, from that officer-involved shooting. That's underway. The, the only thing that I can share is what I shared on that night. We had undercover narcotics detectives in the area conducting a, a drug investigation. They developed probable cause to arrest two uh, adult males who were inside of a car, and when they made um, steps to affect that arrest, the driver took off, and he, he drove very erratically um, for a short distance, and, and then when the police officers made uh, immediate efforts to apprehend him, that's when one of our officers discharged his firearm and non-fatally struck the driver in, in the arm. Um, that's under investigation. Uh, I don't have anything to add to it right now, but that will receive the same level of investigative attention uh, and scrutiny as as the one that we're talking about today. Can you imagine any of the other officers that were in body bags? No, they were not. Uh, our undercover officers, consistent with undercover officers regionally and nationally, uh, work in a covert capacity routinely, and they work with confidential informants, and they work in undercover capacities where they're introduced to suspects and perpetrators. So the presence of a body-worn camera for an undercover operation would be uh, counterintuitive. Uh, 
Um, so, no, he, he, he was not wearing a body camera. Chief, can you say whether or not police did search the vehicle and they found drugs or a gun in that vehicle? The other night? I'm sorry, I was looking, I thought you were talking. Excuse me, the seven corners incident. Uh, the, there, no gun was recovered. But again, that investigation is, is underway. Did you have one or you just? So to get back to the family, you know, we really have to respect the family's privacy. So I, I am not going to offer uh, an assessment about how the family feels or doesn't feel. Um, you know, they're, they're going through a lot right now. So, so I'm not going to characterize anything about the family other than to, to say that it's a very um, sad time for them. And, and, and I get that. So the, uh, the duty status of the two officers who use their less lethal tools, as I'm looking over here, I'll get back to you on that. I know the officer who discharged his firearm remains on on an administrative status. What is his name and how long has he been on that? That's been released. We released that uh, within, we have another policy. We released that within 10 days. So we can get that to you um, right after. I just want to know how long he's been on the job. And if that was something that was. I think it's all part of the release. Yep. Yes, sir. Well, um, I think what I said at the Springfield officer-involved shooting, was that, that was our third of the year, and now we've since had our fourth and our fifth. And, and I'm glad you asked that question because for a jurisdiction that um, has a population of 1.2, 1.3 million people, over the last decade we have averaged 1.5 officer-involved shootings a year for the last decade. Now, if you go back to the first decade of this century, the numbers were, were higher. Uh, and they fluctuate a bit year by year. But the fact that we have five officer-involved shootings year to date is unusual. Uh, as I look at patterns and trends, and it's, uh, it's our responsibility to do that, every time uh, there's something like, like where we are now, we have five. We had one all last year. Now we have five year to date. So we, we take a critical look at each and every one of them. But holistically, uh, I can say that the majority of the folks who are involved, again, sadly, and there's no blaming or shaming going on here, but sadly, there's a degree, a, a strong degree of mental health and behavioral crisis. And again, that speaks to what are we going to do about it. Uh, the the co-responder co -responder model uh, is, is important. Every day, Paul. Every day. So 6,700 year to date, um, 33 a day. And that is more than twice the number of behavioral and mental health calls for service that we responded to just a couple years ago. We're at a unique time. Yes, sir. In the, in the video, Mr. Lynch asked if his parents are there. So just to confirm, this was his parents' house? Where he it was his parents' home, and they were not home. Uh, I don't know why he asked that, but he certainly does ask that. Uh, his parents were not at home. In fact, again, I want to respect the privacy of the, of the parents and the integrity of the investigation that's still early and ongoing. Um, our clinician had communicated with the parents on the earlier call for service an hour and a half before this call for service. More questions? Yes, ma'am. Do you have, you have one? Yes, sir. Um, Christy, right? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, they may find it disturbing and so I know you started off saying this initially but just maybe your message to the community about this loss of life yeah well, I, I you know I, I started off with that message because it's the most important message so if it's helpful to say it again I, I certainly will uh, and we can't we can't say it enough can't say it enough any use of force 
that's depicted on video, particularly any deadly use of force, certainly is tough to watch. It's tough to watch. And it's tough for us to watch, it's tough for you to watch, but it's even tougher for the family to watch. So our message is anytime we have to use force, particularly when it comes to trying to help someone in crisis, and again, we only use force less than 1% of the time. And, and I hope to see that in someone's reporting. Less than 1% of the time we use force. Uh, when, we, when we use deadly force, it is and should be subject to great scrutiny and a thorough investigation. And, and I and we are committed to being transparent. Again, this presser, it's a policy now. It wasn't even a policy a year ago, it's a policy now. And as we reach a conclusion, of this investigative process, uh, we'll be back standing before our community to, to offer that assessment as well. Thank you all. Yeah. Uh -huh.